Today I want to talk with you about how some things can come into our life unnoticed, and that would include uh, influences in our life. Now, how many of you have played Where's Waldo, the game, okay? Uh, and uh, uh, I, I, no one ever, at, when I was a kid, no one ever explained to me who Waldo was, and why it was important that we even find him. You know, it's like, uh, maybe he should be lost. I don't know. So, uh, uh, but apparently it's a game. Uh, and so I, I, I don't know when it was invented or whatnot, but we played it with our kids and it kept them busy, I guess, looking for Waldo. Uh, and, but the whole concept of Waldo and the whole, the whole idea is that he, you, the writers or illustrators would slip Waldo into a scene unnoticed. And a lot of times things come into our life at first unnoticed. And that brings us to Jude. And so uh, in, the, in the book of Jude, uh, Jude talks about some things that were coming into the church unnoticed. And I want us to think today about what have we allowed into our churches? What have we allowed into our families? What have we allowed into our minds that has been unnoticed but is now influencing us in a bad way. Uh, and so let's take, take up Jude, uh, verse 1. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation— I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men, who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to focus again on that phrase, crept in unnoticed. So Jude is talking about a bad situation where the church that he loves, the church that, that he is serving in, uh, is now being influenced and undermined and corrupted by people that had come into that church at first unnoticed, but now were causing major problems. So we're going to talk today about the influences in our lives that have crept in unnoticed. Now, for those of you that may have OCD, I do want to bring us back to Waldo, because some of you are probably wondering, well, where is Waldo, okay? Uh, he's right there, okay? Uh, me trying to be a conscientious pastor, I did take the time to look and find Waldo. Uh, so there he is, okay? So uh, I want to speak in general about uh, uh, the influences that we have. There was a motivational speaker from yesteryear. I, I still enjoy listening to him, watching him. Uh, he's passed away several years ago, but his name was Jim Rohn. And uh, Jim Rohn would say that you are the average of the five closest people in your life. Now, some uh, statisticians and economists have challenged that and said it's an oversimplification. Okay, yes, it is. Um, it's an oversimplification, but it's still close to the truth. And what Jim Rohn is trying to say, and what that saying is trying to say, and what I think all we, can, we can all hopefully agree on, is that we are all deeply influenced by the people in our lives. And, and you think about right now, I want you to think about the people that you are closest with, the people that you hang out with the most, the people that you spend the most time with, the people that you have delegated a degree of trust to, the people that you depend on and count on oftentimes. Think about those people, and I hope you will agree with me that they have influenced you. They have influenced you. Uh, and, and Jude is saying we should be careful who influences us. In fact, the book of Proverbs tells us, be careful over and over again, it tells us, don't hang out with the wrong crowd. Uh, I remember talking to a dad here at the church, and he said that one of his biggest goals uh, when his kids were growing up is to make sure he knew who their friends were. Because he, could, he knew that based on who their friends were, he knew if they would be going off in the wrong direction or staying on the right path. Um, and I wonder you know, how many parents today know who their, friend, who their kids' friends are. Uh, that's a pretty important question, pretty important thing to know. Uh, and so we need, to, we need to, there's a reason why Paul, for example, says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And, and the reason is because if, you, if, you're, if you're yoked in a, in a way that you're, you're dependent on, latched on to whatever, someone that does not share 
your beliefs and your convictions, who does not even believe that God is real, for example, and you claim to follow the Lord, then you, in a sense, are going to be an un, you're going to be an unstable person. You know, James talks about an unstable person, you know, a person that's divided in their mind. And so, uh, what to, uh, you know, think about the people in your life and think about the influences that you have. Who do you listen to? Who are the people in your life that you trust? Who do you depend on for information? Who do you look to to guide you uh, and to help you? Uh, these are very important questions. Now, the, the challenge that we have today is that the number of influences on our life is much greater than was the case in Jude's day. So this is really a challenge that's, that's amplified considerably. Uh, and let me, let me explain that by giving you a little short history lesson, okay? I know not everyone here likes history. That's okay. Not everyone has to be cool. Okay, I get that. But, um, but history is important, okay? And, um, and so, so here we go. Back in the beginning of time, the dawn of human history, uh, people were influenced by the people immediately in their life. So made in their family and then their friends. And as the human race continued to grow and develop and so on and so forth, that influence would extend out to co-workers, members of the community or the tribe or whatever. And so, uh, but that basically the influence was the people in your life, the people that you interacted with daily, they, they were your influences. Then, you know, people started writing stuff. And there was a lot of things being circulated and writings and stuff, at first on stone tablets or cave, you know, whatever markings or whatever, and later on paper uh, and papyrus and scrolls and everything. And then people began to be influenced by writing. And, uh, but even so, still, up until about the Renaissance period, you know, writing influenced people, certainly, but still people were primarily influenced by their parents, their siblings, uh, by their uh, extended family, by their community, mainly that. But then comes the Renaissance period. And now you've got, or education becomes more organized and more systematized. And this guy named Johann Gutenberg invents something. And he invents something called the printing press. And the printing press changes everything. Uh, years ago, uh, I think it was, uh, I forget who it was, some a &E, I think a &E, ranked ranked, uh, the most influential people of the millennium, back when, we, when it turned to the year 2000. And Gutenberg was number one, uh, the most influential person of the entire millennium uh, because of the printing press. And so now people were influenced by published writings and published authors, influenced by people that they never met, never interacted with, except to read their books or read their pamphlets or read newspapers. Then comes the Industrial Revolution, and things explode even more, and there's even more writing. And now you've got uh, people being influenced by magazines and books and dime novels and all kinds of things. And then comes the 20th century, radio. Radio becomes big and people start being influenced by radio and they start listening more to the radio and families gathering around the radio listening to fireside chats in the President of the United States, you know, and things like that. And so radio changes everything. Then television. And now television, now people are going to TV and looking for influences from TV and people, celebrities they've never met before. So now TV is adding to this. Then cable TV. Now, I remember this change. I remember this change. I, I mean, I'm not that old. Some of my kids think I am, but I'm not that old. And I remember uh, this change. I, I remember when I was a kid, I had a black and white TV. I thought that was big stuff, you know, and I had a black and white TV that I had to actually turn the channels, you know. Then they invented this thing called the remote control device, which was cool, you know, and then they come up with more channels and stuff. And so I remember when cable TV came on, I'm like, whoa, I'm no longer limited to four, five, seven, nine, 20, 22, 26, and I think 53, I think, you know, uh, that was if you could twist the rabbit ears a certain way and, and get that in. So now I've got all these hundreds of channels, hundreds of channels to watch. By, by the way, have you ever, have you ever been like, you got hundreds of channels and there's nothing on TV worth seeing. You know what I'm saying? Then it comes to, well, guess what? Now we have the internet, you know? And so, so cable TV was overtaken by the internet. And now you've got uh, Netflix and you've got Amazon Prime and you've got Hulu and you've got all these other places and YouTube. More people watch YouTube than broadcast TV now. Uh, and you've got Facebook and you've got social media and you've got all these things. And so now we are influenced by all that. Do you realize that as of January of last year, there were 1.94 billion websites? 
1.94 billion websites as of January of last year. That number has, I'm sure, gone up tremendously since then. The average human being today, I don't know who estimates this or how they estimate it, but just based on words and pictures and images and games and stuff that we play, the average person receives or takes in or at least is exposed to, on average, 34 gigabytes of data every day. Now, uh, not if we don't retain that much, you know, at least in the conscious sense, but we're exposed to a lot of data. The bottom line is we are dramatically influenced in an avalanche of information. We live in an age of information overload today. And there's so much information that we can't even keep track of it now. And it's stressful. And we are dramatically and deeply affected by this. Now, you might be thinking, not me, Pastor. I'm intelligent, I'm smart, I'm conscientious, I'm a good steward, I'm self-sufficient, I'm not influenced by nobody. No. Well, if you thought that, you were influenced by me to respond to that and think that, okay? Uh, but the bottom line is, you're deceiving yourself. Uh, you're fooling yourself. We are all influenced in ways that we don't even fully understand or appreciate. Uh, we are influenced, uh, you know, for example, when you go to the movies, do you know that the movie theaters have it down to a science how to influence you to buy popcorn and soda? I know because I do so. <laughs> and uh, I willingly succumb to that influence, you know. Um, they have it down to a science with how much, how much that popcorn smell permeates through the theater and everything, and they show you all those images of the Coke being poured over the ice cubes and everything. When you go to a fast food restaurant and you see, they look picture like a Big Mac, like it's a work of art, you know, kind of thing. And, uh, and it never looks like that when it comes out in the box, you know, like it does on the picture there. But they have everything down to a science. Consumer psychology is a science. And, and, and you are dramatically influenced by a number of things that you don't even know. I mean, basic things, like some grocery stores, they will play music fast so people will shop faster, and it works. Uh, you know, you, I mean, we are influenced in so many ways. And it, it, in, in this dizzying world of information overload, it's like, you, you, how do you sort through this? How do you, how do you process this, you know? And, uh, and so you have to make decisions. You got to make decisions on on, okay, I'm going to listen to this. I'm going to, I'm going to choose to be influenced by this. I'm going to focus here, focus there. Otherwise, you're, you're going to go crazy. And, uh, and so on social media, for example, that's why they have the follow button. And so you, you choose to follow who you choose to follow on Facebook or, or Instagram or Pinterest or YouTube or I, 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 TikTok. I, I lose track of all the different social media channels that are out there. There's a whole bunch. Uh, but you hit that follow button. But ultimately, you're choosing to follow based on whoever you give your attention to. And people are competing for your attention. They're competing for your focus. And I want you to really think about, most people don't even think about this. Step back and think, who do I give my attention to? Now, when you think about the kind of person that you want to be, you think about, I hope everyone here wants to be joyful. Hopefully, everyone here wants to be peaceful. Well, you know, if you're striving for strife, maybe, you know, maybe you need to step back a few paces and consider that. Uh, but hopefully everyone here wants to live in and in, in, in have an environment where they're peaceful, positive, have a good attitude and everything. So I want you to think. Think here. Look at the people in your life. Look at what you listen to. Look at what you pay attention to, what you read, what you focus on. Are those things... Do they reflect the kind of person that you want to be? You know, you might say, well, pastor, I mean, some of these people are my close friends. Some of them are my family. Some of these people, some of these things, I, I got to watch the news, for example. You know, I have found that I am in a better mood in general the less news I watch. I've got a friend of mine on Facebook, and he, he messages me almost every week bitterly complaining about the president and about the politics and things like that. And I'm like, well, next time I talk to Donald Trump, I'll, I'll let him know your opinion. You know, I, I, uh, you know, there are people that get so into, into focusing on different things. They get swept up in the emotion of it all. And then they, they're, they're literally bursting with energy and anger and frustration that they got to vent to somebody. And you know, you wonder why we're so divided today. 
And, and here's, I mean, I read a cool, interesting book last year about how we are literally manipulated by the media. And, uh, and it, was, it was written by a guy who has been in his past a professional media manipulator. And he would do things, including very deceitful things, to deliberately and intentionally plant stories and misinformation in the press and see that take off. And, you know, we, we are, we, sometimes you just got to get off that train. I'm not saying you'd be ignorant, but you can just take like 15 minutes of your day, maybe 10 minutes of your day and check the headlines and check some important stuff and just see what's going on and be informed and then move on with your day. Otherwise, you get swept up. You realize that news media organizations and stuff, they thrive on emotion, and that's how they get people to read and pay attention. They get people to do that. So um, they thrive on showing you scandals and showing you you conspiracies and showing you um, anger and and fighting and who told who to shut up and da 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 and how, and, and we get and we get we get sucked into that we get sucked into the watching celebrities uh, another celebrity couple is divorced another celebrity couple is this someone's suing someone in court someone's doing this and then we watch it for entertainment's sake too we watch reality tv you know and we watch this contrived reality shows where people are yelling at each other and screaming at each other and we watch uh, uh, soap operas and well, I don't but you know anyways so we watch all this other stuff and and, and then we wonder why we're anxious and why we're worried and why we're upset and why we're always like frayed and on edge. I want you to think about who do you listen to, what do you listen to, what do you watch, what do you put into your mind? If you want to live a positive life, you've got to empty out the negative. And if you feed the, your mind with negative stuff and toxic stuff, then guess what you're going to become? So think about the kind of person you want to be. Think about what God wants you to be and what God wants for his church and what God wants for his people. God wants his people to be life-giving, truth-seeking, love-giving. And the enemy wants confusion, bitterness, resentment, pursue your pleasures and sensuality no matter the cost, you know, so on and so forth. And think about which direction society is going right now. Uh, and so I, I want to encourage you to be a good steward of your attention. Who do you listen to? What do you pay attention to? Who do you follow? Not everyone and not everything is worthy of your time and attention. You have got to be a good steward, and you've got to choose what you focus on. Um, you know... One of the things that we can all slip into, too, is complaining and negativity and so forth. And if we're complaining about stuff that's bad, we, we pat ourselves on the back and think that we should complain about it. But I read the Bible, and I'm like, you know, I see, I see us called to prayer, and I see us called to solve things. I don't see us called to complain much. In fact, the Bible tells us not to complain. Philippians 2, the verse that we all violate. Mm-hmm. Philippians 2.14. Um, and so we, we need to be very careful of what we allow into our minds and who we follow. Now, Jude specifically zeroes in on the Christian community and Christian teachers. So let's talk about that. Who do you listen to and who do you follow when it comes to Christian teachings, when it comes to theology, when it comes to what you what you should believe as a follower of Jesus Christ. I have here some people. Now, I will tell you right now, one of these people I like and listen to on a regular basis. Um, I'll tell you who. <laughs> uh, you can guess. Uh, the others, the others I, there's a couple others on here that have some good things to say every now and then, and there's a couple people up there that I don't ever listen to and would encourage you not to as well. Um, and, you know, you look at, you, same thing, you know, you've got uh, uh, people that, that, these are all people that have major followings in the Christian world, in the Christian community. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with them. Uh, and, uh, and then we've got books that are out there, you know, and stuff. And, you know, not every book, not every book that calls itself a Christian book is truly Christian, you know. And, and yet uh, you've got some great books out there. And you've got some bad books out there in the Christian world. And you've got some good podcasts and bad podcasts and good blogs and bad blogs. And you've got some good preachers and bad preachers. And a lot of times we don't 
exercise discernment on who we listen to. Just as a side note here, when it comes to Christian, the book's not pictured up there, but one of the best-selling Christian books, I have not read it, so I cannot critique it. It's called Girl, Wash Your Face, okay? And uh, Rachel Hollis, I think, wrote it. I, I don't know much about Rachel Hollis. I, don't, I haven't read the book, so I can't tell you if it's good or bad. But the title, it's just like, man, that title has sold tons of books. And so a friend and I are batting around book titles in case we want to write a best-selling Christian book, and we've come up with Bro, Comb Your Hair, you know? And so maybe that will sell lots of books. I don't know. Um, but uh, so coming soon, you know, excuse me. So uh, if, you, if you think about um, the kind of, the kind of uh, um, people that Christians often gravitate to in their teachings— I want you to think, do people gravitate to teachers mainly because of the theology and the content of that and how it helps them grow closer to God or for other reasons? And, and if you think about all the, all the preachers out there, all the teachers out there, everything out in the Christian world, how much of it is good and how much of it is not so good? Ultimately, you want to gravitate toward teachers that are going to help you grow closer with the Lord. That's what you want. Uh, now, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a, uh, a, a, when you think about all the influences out there, I'm going to give you a uh, uh, pastor pet peeve. So here comes a Pastor Brian soapbox here, okay? Um, but I think, I, I think I'm on good ground because this, this flows from where Jesus was teaching about the church. I'm a believer in the local church. And, and, and the, the intention, the original intent of the local church was that people would look to the local church, primarily, for their spiritual nourishment. And, and that's outside of the family. I want to back up and make it clear. I believe parents are the main disciples of their children. And so I believe the family should be the primary influence on everything, including, including spirituality and your walk with the Lord. Uh, and so I commend all parents here that are conscientious in that role. And I want you to know we as a church support you, and our desire is to come alongside you and help you with that. But outside of the immediate family— the idea is that the church should be the conduit through which the Lord teaches us how to grow in the, in the Lord and how to deepen our walk with the Lord. But what I find today, something that Jude would find, like he'd scratch his head and look at us like in disbelief and almost speechless, is today people are going, Christians, I'm talking Christians, are going sometimes everywhere but the church for their spiritual information and spiritual nourishment. And in fact, you've got Christians that listen more to non-Christians on what they should believe than Christians. I mean, literally, um, you've got Christians that will sometimes look to the world to see what's acceptable to believe in, what views they should hold that are, that are acceptable, views that won't get them criticized, for example. And then they base their values and convictions and beliefs on what the world says before they will even look at what, what, the, what the church is teaching. And another thing about the local church is in the local church, if the local church is done right, if it's done right, and I believe we're doing it right here, but if it's done right, there's accountability in the local church. So if I get up and I say to you, you know what? I don't really believe in Jesus anymore. Just for clarification, this is a hypothetical statement, okay? So then there's accountability. I can be removed by you all, and I should be for that. Um, if, if a pastor becomes corrupt, unethical, unbiblical, the pastor can be removed in a local church setting. There's accountability there, checks and balances there, if it's done right. Now, unfortunately, in a lot of churches, it's not done that way. I know of a church that's not too far from here, where the pastor has had numerous affairs, and there's been questions of embezzlement with church money, and he's still the pastor, and it's still a mega church. And the reason why is because people are, I mean, I hate to say this, but people can can kick easily into sheep mode and they can just go and be consumers and they just sit and they just listen and they go home and they're not engaged and and in a and, a, and by, just as a, as a uh, another pet peeve sorry this is a pet peeve a unique pet peeve i'm giving to the 11 o'clock service because i didn't think about this at nine o'clock but here we go uh there's not a lot of commitment anymore in these days in this day and age too people are very shallow in their in their level of commitment to the church and their involvement and so uh that's not good that's not good. We, this, is, this church thing is supposed to be we're a family. We're a family. And you don't just like 
you don't treat your family, if you want it to be a healthy family, like you're a consumer. You know, give me what I want. If, you don't, if I don't get it, I'm out. Um, and so uh, there's, in the local church, there's accountability. And that is the conduit that the Lord designed for there to be spiritual nourishment and teaching. Now, I'm not being legalistic about this. I'm not saying that you should never listen to anyone outside the church. I'm not saying that. I promise you I'm not saying that. That's like a cult. I'm not going there. But what I am saying is that, is that you know, there's a reason why the local church exists. There's a reason why Jude, you know, it, we're, we're, Jude refers to the local church, I believe, maybe it's Paul, as the, it's Paul, the pillar and ground of the truth. And there's a reason for that, because the, the local church is supposed to teach the truth and is supposed to guard against false teaching. And now if you are latching on to a ministry outside the church, you lose that accountability and you lose that connection. Now, I, I, I'll share with my heart here. It is my goal. It is my desire that our church grow more. I would like to see us fill up two services. I'd like to see us start planting other churches. It is not my goal. Now, I want to say the most important thing is that we do God's plan, not, not my plan. I want to be clear on that, okay? So whatever God wants, God gets, okay, as far as I'm concerned. But it is not my desire to build us into a mega church where I lose all touch with, with the congregation. Because I think that I think that there's value, and I'm not bashing mega churches when I say this, okay? But I think, th- I think there's value in the people at least having some degree of connection with the pastors. And, and, and when, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you know me, and you know my wife, and you know my kids, and you know me, it's easier to know, is this guy worth listening to? Uh, and, and, uh, and, and, you know, otherwise, otherwise, if you're talking about a televangelist or a, or a minister off to the side that you have no connection with or no knowledge of, how do you know? How do you know? Where's the accountability there? And so, um, so I think there's value in the local church, which is why I'm cautious, not against, but I'm cautious about us getting subsumed by ministries outside the local church. Uh, and if we're going to venture outside the local church, I like to stay within our denomination because I know pretty much that they're on the right path in terms of the, our statement of faith and doctrines and so on and so forth. Um, and there's accountability there. Um, so bottom line is, choose your influences wisely. And when you decide what church you're going to unite with and what church you're going to stay with, here's a pet peeve of mine again. I think I'm on solid biblical ground on this. You should not choose your church based on um, the color of the carpet or based on, well, the other pastor makes me laugh more uh, or this or that or, you know, I like that. It should be based on, am I growing in the Lord? And is is what I'm hearing from the pulpit the truth? You know, am, am I being taught the truth or am I being taught a lie? So how do you know whether you're being taught a lie or not? Well, John tells us, he addresses this. Uh, He says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. I have encountered people as a pastor who, who I've had people come to me and say that they are a prophet. And, um, And they will tell me, what God has told them to tell me, so they claim. Um, so I immediately think of this verse. Uh, I am not supposed to just, if someone comes to me and says, you know, God told me to tell you, and I'm a prophet, by the way, so you should listen to me. Um, I'm not just going to say, oh, wow, welcome, thank you. I've been looking for a prophet to come and tell me what I should do. Uh, you know, because obviously I don't communicate with God myself, so I'm glad you've come along so I can hear from God. Um, you know, the Bible says, try the spirits, whether they are of God. You should test it. Paul talks about this. Test all things and hold on to what is good. You test it. Uh, in fact, John, this is, this is interesting. John doesn't just say test human teachers, but John says test the spirits. So in other words, test your spiritual experiences too. Now, here's, here's something a lot, you don't hear a lot, but it's, you need to hear this. God is not the only one that can provide a spiritual experience for you. John, just a, another verse later or two verses later, says that Satan can disguise himself as an angel of light. 
The enemy can sow confusion and deceit. The enemy can provide supernatural spiritual experiences too. So just because, even John would say, even if you've seen an angel, even if you've seen a vision, test what you are told. You don't just go with it. And I have heard people, Christians today are very susceptible to this. They will go to a concert or they will listen to a song on the radio or even a song in church and they will, they will get deeply moved by it and have a great spiritual experience and, then they, and they will base their theology on that. And, and I, I want to say, uh, he's not here today, but, but Daniel and all of our music team, they do a great job in making sure that the songs that are sung are doctrinally sound. So I'm going to commend our, our music ministry for that. Um, and, but, you know, um, if you're basing your theology on, on your favorite Christian song on the radio, then you're off track on what the Bible teaches. You should base your theology on the Word of God. On the Word of God. And if a song encourages you and supplements that, wonderful. But test it against the Word of God. There are some Christian songs being played on the radio which are not biblically correct. And so you need to, you need to make sure you test that. And, and just because you've had a wonderful experience does not mean that that's God speaking to you. Maybe it's the enemy deceiving you, telling you what you want to hear, leading you in a certain direction. Test everything. Test everything. Uh, many years ago, uh, when Ronald Reagan was president, he and Mikhail Gorbachev were doing peace talks and everything, and there was a saying that he had, and even Gorbachev thought it was funny, and it was like, trust, but verify, you know? And, and that's the thing. It's like, you know, ha- have an attitude. Don't, don't, like, be cynical, and don't be, like, dismissive of everything. Listen to people. Be polite to people, especially people that you've chosen to trust. But understand, they are all people, and you've got to verify what they say against the Word of God. That includes me. When I preach something, if you don't like it or whatever, then check it against the Scripture. In fact, fact, even if you do like it, check it against the Scripture. Make sure that what I say is true, because the Bible is, the one, is what I will stand on and stand behind. Uh, and so test the spirits. Jesus, or let me back, back for a second. Jude also gives us another clue on how, to, on how to know if you're dealing with false teachers. Jude describes the false teachers that had infiltrated the church. In verses 16 and 19, he describes them as grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lusts, and they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. Now, think about these are people. Now, these aren't just uh, preachers that he's talking about. That certainly includes preachers. But he's talking about people in the church in general that are teaching others and misleading others, okay? And he's saying these are people, they grumble a lot. They're known as routine grumblers. Now, don't look at anyone, but do you know anyone like that, okay? All right, grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lust. That's not just sexual lust. That's lust in general, okay? Walking according to their, they follow what they want. And they mouth great swelling words. They sound good. They know the code words, you know. They can throw in the, the, the cool words that make them sound like they're good, you know, but they, they swelling words, eloquent, um, and they flatter people. They flatter to manipulate and gain advantage. Uh, Paul, John, Jude, uh, and Jesus, as we're about to see, warns us several times about people like that. These are sensual persons who cause divisions not having the Spirit. They're not driven by the Holy Spirit. They're driven by their lusts and by their wants, and they sow division. Now, Jesus also tells us how to spot false teachers. Jesus says uh, our false influences. Beware of false prophets. Now, don't get hung up on the word prophet, because Jesus is not just talking about people that claim to know the future or foretell the future. Jesus is also talking about people, who, basically people who claim to bring divine revelation. All right, so beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, they are ravenous wolves. Um, in other words, look to the heart. Look to the heart, not just the surface. Um, and you will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. 
Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. All right, so uh, what does Jesus mean by fruit? And a lot of people would look at that and say numbers. It's numbers. It's statistics. If that's the case, then Noah was a false teacher. Noah preached for 120 years. Imagine that. Preaching day in and day out for 120 years. And the only people at the end of that that are following God is your own family. That's Noah. But was Noah a false teacher? No. So Jesus, when he talks about fruit, is not just talking about numbers. He's not just talking about statistics. I know some pastors and missionaries that are in Europe right now. You talk about a cold mission field. Europe is becoming more and more and more secular, more agnostic and more hostile to Christianity. Not every country, but a lot of the countries in Europe are. And, and I know, I remember talking to a missionary a few years ago. He came and visited our church, and I had lunch with him here in Olney, and we were talking. And we're talking God-fearing, Bible-believing, Jesus-loving churches in Europe that maybe have had one or two salvations and baptisms in a number of years. Years. This does not mean that they're, that they're, that they're uh, bad teachers or false prophets or anything. It means they're in a cold and difficult and challenging mission field. So numbers and statistics are not really what Jesus is talking about. He's not talking about quantity of fruit. He's talking about the quality of the fruit. What kind of fruit is being produced? And so if you want to know whether a teacher is a good teacher or a bad teacher, spiritually speaking, look at that teacher's fruit. And you look at their life, their family, their circle of friends, their motives, their lifestyle, and look at the people they are influencing and what those people look like. So I'm not going to name any names, and it really is not my desire to get up here and bash other pastors and stuff. I realize that some pastors can make mistakes and fall short and get into a season of difficulty, and hopefully... There's godly people there that can bring them back, you know. But, you know, I would say a warning sign, a yellow light would be if a pastor starts really pushing for a private jet. That might not be good fruit, okay? All right? And, uh, you know, and when you think about when a pastor gets on TV and says, run up your credit card, even to the max, sow a seed of faith, and, 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 and send me that donation, and God will you know, bless you. I mean, when you start hearing stuff like that, and then you look at that, that, that guy's lifestyle, and you look at how that money's being spent, that's their indications. By the way, that's another, another argument for the local church. If you come to business meetings, you know how the money's spent. Everything's open. You know how it's spent. Transparency. And so um, make sure that, uh, that, that you, you're looking at the fruit. That's what Jesus says. Look at the fruit. Watch the fruit. And and then you choose whether you want to follow this teacher or not. Uh, but here's the real problem. Here's the real problem. Um, there wouldn't be false teachers if there weren't people that liked to listen to false teachers. Paul writes, for the time will come, that by the way, that time is here, <laughs> uh, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Is Paul describing the 21st century church or not? I mean, people that will not endure sound doctrine. Here's, I mean, let me just tell you my naivety here. I remember telling this to my pastor, and he laughed. And, um, and I, I, you know, I, oftentimes I feel like I can't use illustrations because someone's going to feel like I'm preaching at them or attacking them. I promise you I'm not. Okay, just, just hear me on this. But I had the naivety to believe that if a Christian in, in a church that I served as pastor had an objection to something I was doing or an objection to the direction the church was going, all I would need to do, open up the Bible and explain clearly from the Word of God why we're doing it, and that Christian would be okay. And they would, life would go on and everything would be happy. Whew, not the case. Not the case. Uh, and in fact, dealing, whether we're dealing with controversial issues of the day in the news or whether we're dealing with issues of the church, uh, I have found time and time and time and time again that I can be, and not that I'm always right, I'm not. 
I can be wrong. And I have corrected myself when I've been shown to be wrong. I've corrected myself publicly. But when I feel pretty confident after lots of study and lots of prayer that I'm standing on solid biblical ground, there will be people that will be against it and people that will be opposed to it. And I talk with them, and it's clear that they're not basing that opposition or disagreement on Scripture. They're basing it on their own feelings and preferences and opinions and emotions. Um, one of the most controversial issues today is, is salvation itself, probably the most controversial one. You know, it doesn't, you, no, no one wants to hear the way to get to heaven is through Jesus. At least no non Christian wants to hear that. And in fact, if you say publicly, and you talk about preachers that have been interviewed on national television and they have to admit that, yeah, Jesus is the way to heaven, man controversy rains down on that preacher, and he is called every name in the book. It would be politically correct in this day and age, and it would be comfortable for me to get up here and say to you, you know what? Some people believe in Jesus. Some people don't. Everyone's got to find their own way. Just be good, and God will let you in. If I said that, that would be palatable. Most people could receive that. Most people. There'd be someone to complain about everything, but most people could receive that. Um, but that sounds good. That plays well on the Oprah show, for example. That plays well there. But that is, that may be politically correct, but it's not theologically correct. I don't get to decide who goes to heaven and who doesn't. That's above my pay grade. Jesus did not make me the door. Jesus is the door. He's the one that decides that, and the Bible is clear. I, Jesus speaking, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. I didn't write that. I didn't say that. Jesus said that. And he rose from the dead. I, I'm not going to be able to pull that off, you know. So therefore, I'm going to listen to Jesus. Now, I also, he said, well, that's unloving. Well, that's not unloving because I'm told Jesus, again, for God so loved the world, you know, that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Whoever wants to come can come. That's why we spend so much time and energy and money sending missionaries all around the world to tell them the good news about Jesus Christ because we care and we love people, you know. But it doesn't do anyone any good to lie to them just to make them feel good. You know, a true friend, a true friend, someone that really cares about you is going to tell you the truth even if you don't want to hear it. A true friend is going to look you in the eye and say, you messed up. A true friend is not going to just itch your ears. Uh, and, and so here's my question to you. Who do you want as an influence in your life? Do you want people that are going to make you feel good and tell you what you want to hear? Or do you want people that are going to tell you what you need to hear? Do you want people to tell you what feels good? Or do you want people to tell you what is good? And if you want the right influences in your life, you've got to exercise the discernment and the wisdom to try the spirits, to test all things, and to hold on to what is good. And the person who defines what is good is not you. The person who defines what is good is God himself, because God is good. And so Jude says some words of comfort at the end that... um, that uh, I think, you know, people ask, well, why is it that people get off track? They get off track because they have needs, unmet needs, unmet desires, and the flesh pulls them in in that direction. And they want to hear people that are going to affirm them because they, you know, they want to get those needs met and they want to hear what Hoover's going to affirm them on that. So let me give you an example. Uh, I have a need for ice cream. I do, okay? And, uh, um, and, and since I'm fasting right now on, away from ice cream, it's an unmet need, okay? And, and so I was at Chick-fil-A yesterday. And Chick-fil-A, man, they want to sell you their ice cream, okay? And it's good ice cream, isn't it? It's good, okay? All right, so I got a fellow Chick-fil-A fan up here. And, uh, you know, I like their key lime shake, and I like their, 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 their uh, what do they have right now, the frosted, uh, uh, it, it, the peppermint shake. Yeah, I'm drawing a blank here. Uh, that is some good stuff, all right? I like it. Now, if I wanted to follow false teaching, you know, Jeremiah says the heart's deceitful above all things, I could have said, you know what? I'm in Jesus' favorite restaurant right now. This is Chick-fil-A. 
I'm in God's restaurant. The calories don't count, all right? Can I get an amen on that, you know? And therefore, you know, and we go off track, you know, but that doesn't work. That's not the truth. It's, 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 it, I wish it were, but it's not. It's not the truth. So I got a salad at Chick-fil-A yesterday, okay? Uh, and so that's, that's uh, and, and I, oh, I do like those roasted peppers, you know? And so I got some extra packets of the roasted peppers on there to make up for the lack of the milkshake. It's my way of compensating for that unmet need. But anyway, um, we, all have, we all have itches that we want to scratch, so to speak. We all have unmet needs. We all have things we desire. But the, the key of having fulfillment on that. Seriously, by the way, God will, God will intentionally deny you some pleasures, and he will intentionally call on yourself to deny yourself some pleasures so that you will trust in him. Because the way to get fulfillment and truly have your needs met is not by tacking on these, these artificial things to, your, to yourself or, or putting artificial things in your body. The key to having your needs met, the key to joy and peace is a relationship with God, a relationship that you continually feed, and a relationship where you allow the Holy Spirit to manifest the fruit of the Spirit in your life. And Jude affirms that when he says, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. You need no other source but the chief shepherd. Let's pray. Father, I ask you to bless us, Lord. If there's anyone here today who needs to lay a burden at your feet, who needs to give their life to you, to trust in you, or rededicate their life to you, or make a decision for baptism or church membership or whatever the case may be. This invitation certainly is open for them. But Father, whatever the case may be, Father, I pray that you will encourage all of us. I pray that we will trust in you, rely on you, lean on you, trust in you with our whole heart, not part of our heart, not just a corner of our heart, but our whole heart. Lord, I ask this in your son's holy and very precious name. If you'll please stand.